Story 4 of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 4 On Strike by Albert Payson Turhune from the Popular Magazine. Furthermore, Howji ventured Najib, who had not spoken for fully half an hour, but had been poring over a sheaf of shipment items scribbled in Arabic. Furthermore, I am yearnful to know who was the unhappy person the wicked general threatened. Or, of a perhaps, it was that poor general himself who was bethreatened by his padishah, or by the— What on earth are you babbling about, Najib? absent-mindedly asked Logan Kirby, as he looked up from a month-old New York paper which had arrived by muleteer that day, and which the expatriated American had been reading with pathetic interest. Now, roused from his perusal by Najib's query, Logan saw that the little Syrian has ceased wrestling with the shipment items and was peering over his employer's shoulder, his beady eyes fixed in keen curiosity on the printed page. "'I insist you to tell me, Howji,' said Najib, "'who has been threatening that poor general, or perchancely who has been made to cower himself underneath of that fierce general's threatenings. See, it is there, Howji. There, in the black line, at the left top end of the news, see? Following the guidance of Najib's stubby, unwashed finger, Kirby read the indicated headline, General Strike Threatened. Oh, he answered, choking back a grin, I see. There isn't any general, Najib, and he isn't threatened. It means, may the faces of all liars be blackened, cried Najib in virtuous indignation and may the maker of the accursed newspage lie be doubly afflictioned may his camels die and his wives cast dust upon his bared head for he has befooled me by what he has here imprinted my heart went out with a sweet sorrowfulness for that poor general or for the folk he threatened whichever it might chance itself to be and now the news person has made a jest of the truth but he Kirby's attempt at self-control went to pieces. He guffawed. Najib eyed him sourly, then said in icy reproof, It is known to all, Howji, that Sidi ben Hassan the sheik was the wisest of men, and did not Sidi ben Hassan make known in his book that laughter is for women and for hyenas. Furthermore, I'm sorry I laughed at you, Najib, returned Kirby, with due penitence. I don't wonder you got such an idea from the headline. You see, I have read the story that goes under it. That's how I happen to know what it means. It means that several thousand workmen of several allied trades threaten to go on strike. That will tie up a lot of business, you see, along a lot of lines. It will mean a general tie-up up from Najib's blank face, the American saw his more or less technical explanation was going wide. Still remorseful at having hurt his factotum's feeling, Kirby laid the paper aside and undertook to simplify the matter. "'It's like this,' said he. "'We'll say a gang of men aren't satisfied with the pay or the hours they are getting. They ask for more money, or for shorter hours, or for both. If the demand is refused, they stop working.' They won't go back to their jobs till they get the cash and the hours they want. That is known as going on strike. When a number of concerns are involved in it, it's sometimes called a general strike. This paper says a general strike is threatened. That means, I perceive it, Howji, exclaimed Najib. I am onward to it now. I might have known the printed page cannot lie. But, oh, my heart berends itself when I think of the sad fate of those poor folk who do the stroking. Of an assuredly Allah hath deprived them of wisdom. Not necessarily, argued Kirby, wondering at his henchman's outburst of sympathy for union laborers so many thousands of miles away. They may win, you know, or at least get a compromise, and their union will support them while they are out of work. Of course, they may lose, and then— But when they make refusal to do their work, urged Najib, will not the soldiers of the Pasha cut them to ribbons with a korbash and drive them back to their toil? Or if the Pasha of that Pashalik is a brutesome man, will not he cast those poor fellaheen into the prison and besiege their goods? 
and i answer howadji he will wherefore my eyes are tearing for the men who have so unlucklessly hold on exhorted kirby albeit despairing of opening the mind of a man whose forebears for thousands of years had lived in a land where the courvey forced labor was a hallowed institution and when the money of employers could always enlist the aid of government soldiery to keep the fellaheen at their tasks hold on that sort of thing is dead and done with even in the east chinese gordon stamped out the last of it in egypt years ago if a man doesn't want to work he can't be forced to all his boss can do is to fire him and try to get someone in his place when a whole factory of men strike especially if there are any big contract orders to fill in a rush the employers sometimes find it cheaper to give them what they want than to call in untrained strike breakers on the other hand sometimes the boss can bring them in to terms it all depends yielding to the human joy of imparting instruction to so interested a listener kirby launched forth into an elaboration of his theme trying to expound something of the capital and labor situation to his follower and secretly wondering at the keen zest wherewith his words were listened to seldom was kirby so successful in making najib follow so long an oration and he was pleased with his own new-found powers of explaining occidental customs to an oriental mind now logan kirby knew the tangled syrian character and its myriad queer slants as well as it can be given to a white man to know it kirby's father had been a missionary at nablus he himself had been born there and had spent his boyhood at the mission that is why after he had completed his engineering course at columbia school of mines and had served an apprenticeship in colorado and arizona the cabell smelting company of new york had sent him out to the land of moab as manager of its new acquired little antimony mine the mine a mere prospect shaft was worked by about thirty fellaheen native laborers supervised by a native guard of twelve turkish soldiers small as was the plant it was a rich property and it was piling up dividends for the cabells antimony in the east is used in a score of ways from its employment in the form of coal for the darkening of women's eyes to the chemical by-products always in demand by syrian apothecaries this was the only antimony mine between aden and germany its shipments were in constant demand its revenues were a big item on the credit side of the cabell ledger kirby's personal factotum as well as superintendent of the mine was the squat little syrian najib who had once spent two blissfully useless years with an all nations show at coney island and who there had picked up a language which he proudly believed to be english and which he spoke exclusively when talking with the manager kirby's rare knowledge of the east had enabled the mine to escape ruin a score of times where a manager less conversant with oriental ways must have blundered into some fatal error in the handling of his men or in dealing with the local authorities remember please that in the east it is the seemingly insignificant things which bring disaster to the feringhi or foreigner for example many an american or european has met unavenged death because he did not realize that he was heaping vile affront upon his bedouin host by eating with his left hand many a foreign manager of labor has lost instant and complete control over his fellaheen by deigning to wash his own shirt in the nearby river or for brushing the dirt from his own clothes thereby he has proved himself a laborer instead of a master of men many a foreigner has been shot or stabbed for speaking to a native whom he thought afflicted with a fit and who was really engaged in prayer many more have lost life or authority by laughing at the wrong time or by glancing with entire absence of interest perhaps at some passing woman yes kirby had been invaluable to his employers by virtue of his inborn knowledge of syrian ways yet now he was not enough of an oriental to understand why his lecture on the strike system should thrill his listener 
He did not pause to realize that the idea of strikes was one which carries a true appeal to the Eastern imagination. It has all the elements of revenge, of coercion, and of trapping, of wily give and take, and of simple and logical gambling uncertainty, which characterize the most popular of the Arabian Nights yarns, and which have made those tales remain as Syrian classics for more than ten centuries. It is of an assuredly a pleasing and noble plan, applauded Najib, when Kirby finished the diverse ramifications of his discourse, and I do not misdoubt but what that cruel general bit trembled himself inside of his boots when they threatened to strike. If the stroking ones may not be lawfully attacked by the Pachalik troops, indeed must the general— I told you there wasn't any general, interrupted Kirby, jarred that his luminous explanations had still left Najib more or less where it found him, so far as any lucid idea was concerned. And I've wasted enough time trying to ding the notion of the thing into your thick head. If you've got those shipment items catalogued, go back to the shaft and check off the inventory. The first load ought to be on the way to the coast before sunrise tomorrow. Chase! As he picked up the duplicate sets of the list and ran over their items once more, Kirby tried to forget his own silly annoyance at his failure to make the dull little Syrian comprehend a custom that had never reached the land of Moab. Presently, in his absorption in his work, the American forgot the whole incident. It was the beginning of a rush period at the mine. The busiest month in its history was just setting in. The Alexandretta-bound shipment of the morrow was but the first of twelve big shipments scheduled for the next twenty-nine days. The restoration of peace and the shutting out of several Central European rivals had thrown an unprecedented sheaf of rush orders on the Cabell mine. It was such a chance as Kirby had longed for, a chance to show his rival's customers the quality of the Cabell product and the speed and efficiency wherewith orders could and would be filled by him. If he could but fill these new customers' orders in quicker and more satisfactory fashion than the firms were accustomed to receiving, it might well mean that the new buyers would stick to the Cabells after the other mine should again be in operation. It was a big chance, as Kirby had explained at some length to Najib during the past few weeks. At his behest, the little superintendent had used every known method to get extra work and extra speed out of the fellaheen, and by judicious backsheesh had even impressed to the toil several members of the haughty Turkish guard and certain folk from the nearest hill village. As a result, the first shipment was ready for the muleteers to carry coastward a full week ahead of schedule time and the contract chanced to be one for which the eager wholesalers at Alexandretta had agreed to pay a bonus for early arrival. The men were even now busy getting a second shipment in shape for transportation by mule train to Tiberias and thence by railway to Damascus. The work was progressing finely, Kirby thrilled at the thought, and he was just a little ashamed of his own recent impatience at Najib when he remembered how the superintendent was pushing the relays of consignments along. After all, he mused, it was no reflection on Najib's intelligence that the poor little chap could not grasp the whole involved Occidental strike system in one hasty lecture, and that his simple mind clung to the delusion that there was some fierce general involved in it. In the Arabian Nights was there not always a scheming sultan or a baffled wazir in every clash with the folk of the land? Was it unnatural that Najib should have substituted for these the mythical general of whom he thought he had seen mention in the news headline? But, soon after dusk, Kirby had reason to know that his words had not fallen on barren soil. At close of the working day, Najib had brought the manager the usual diurnal report from the mine. Now, after supper, Kirby, glancing over the report again, found a gap of terse yet complete reports, and occasionally Kirby was obliged to summon his henchman to correct or amend the day's tally sheet. Wherefore, the list in his hand, the American strolled down from his own knoll-top tent toward Najib's quarters. 
As Najib was superintendent, and thus technically an official, Kirby could make such domiciliary visits without loss of prestige, instead of summoning the Syrian to his presence by handclap or by messenger, as would have been necessary in dealing with any of the other employees. Najib's hut lay a hundred yards beyond the hollow where the fellaheen and soldiers were encamped. For Najib, too, had a dignity to uphold. He might no more lodge or break bread with his underlings than might Kirby with him. Yet at times, preparatory to pattering up the knoll for his wanted evening chat with the American at the latter's campfire, Najib would so far unbend as to pause at the fellaheen's camp for a native discussion of many gestures and much loud talking. So it was tonight. Just outside the radius of the fellaheen's firelight, Kirby paused, for he heard Najib's shrill voice uplifted in speech and amusedly he halted and prepared to turn back. He had no wish to break in upon a harangue so interesting as the speaker seemed to find this one. Najib's voice was pitched far above the tones of normal Eastern conversation, louder and more excited even than that of a professional storyteller. In Syria it is hard to believe that these professionals are merely telling an oft-heard Arabian Nights narrative and not indulging in delirium or apoplexy. Yet at a stray word of Najib's, Kirby checked involuntarily his own retreat and paused again to look back. There stood Najib in the center of the firelit circle, hands and head in wild motion. Around him, spellbound, squatted the ring of his dark-faced and unwashed hearers. The superintendent, being with his own people, was orating in pure Arabic, or rather in the colloquial vernacular which is as close to pure Arabic as one can expect to hear, except among the remoter Bedouins. Thus it is, he said, declaiming, even as I had sought to show you, O addle-witted offspring of mangy camels and one-eyed mules, in that far country when men are dissatisfied with their wage, they take counsel together and they say one unto the other, Lo, we shall labor no more unless our hire be greater and our toil hours less. Then go they to their sheik, or whomsoever he be who hath hired them, and they say to him, O favored of Allah, behold, we must have such and such wage and such and such hours of labor. And then doth their sheik cast ashes upon his beard and rend his garments, for doth he not know his fate is upon him and that his breath is in his nostrils? Yet will they not listen to his prayer, but at once they make strike. Then doth their sheik betake himself to the pasha with his grievance, beseeching the pasha with many rich gifts, that he will throw those strike-making laborers into prison and scourge their kinsmen with the kurbash. But the pasha maketh answer with tears, Lo, I am helpless. What saith the law? It saith that a man may make strike at will, and that his employer must pay what is demanded. Now this pasha is named General, and his heart is as gall within him that he may not accept the rich gifts offered by the sheik, and punish the laborers. Yet the law restraineth him. Then the sheik perchance shall refuseth the demands of his toilers, and they say to him then, If you will not employ us, and on the terms we ordain, then shall ye hire none others, for we shall overthrow those whom you set in our places, and perchance we shall destroy your warehouses or barns or shops. This say they, when they know he hath greatest need of them. Then boweth their master his head upon his breast, and saith, Be it even as ye will, my hirelings, for I must obey." and he giveth them of his substance whatsoever they may require, and all are glad, and under the new law, even in this land of ours, none may imprison or beat those who will not work, and all may demand and receive what wage they will, and—and and Kirby waited to hear no more. With a groan of disgust at the orator's imbecility, he went back up the hill to his own tent. There he drew forth his rickety sea-chair and placed it in front of a patch of campfire that twinkled in the open space in front of the tent door. For up there in the hills the nights had an edge of chill to them, be the days ever so hot. 
Stretching himself out lazily in his long chair, Kirby exhumed from a shirt pocket his disreputable briar pipe and filled and lighted it. The big white Syrian stars glinted down on him from a black velvet sky. Along the nearer peaks and hollows of the Moab Mountains, the knots of prowling jackals kept up a running chorus of yapping, a discordant chant punctuated now and then by the faraway howl of a hunting wolf or by the choking laugh of a hyena in the valley below, who thus gave forth the news of some especially delicious bit of carrion discovered among the rocks and kirby was reminded of najib's quoted dictum that laughter is for women and for hyenas the memory brought back to him his squat henchman's weird jumbling of the strike system and he smiled in reminiscent mirth the syrian had been his comrade in many a vicissitude and he knew that najib's fondness for him was as sincere as can be that of any oriental for a foreigner an affection based not wholly on self-interest kirby enjoyed his evening powwows with superintendent beside the campfire and the little man's amazing faculty for mangling the english tongue he rather missed najib's presence to-night but he was not to miss it for long just as he was about to knock out his pipe and go to bed the native came pattering up the slope on excitedly rapid feet and squatted as usual on the ground beside the american's lounging chair in najib's manner there was a scarce repressed jubilant thrill his beady eyes shone wildly hardly had he seated himself when he broke the custom of momentary grave silence by blurting forth furthermore howadji i am the bearer of gladly tidings which will make you to beshout yourself aloud for joyfulness and leap about and beclaim a pretty fair and other words of a grand rapture for the bird will sing gleesome dirges in your heart well queried kirby in no especial excitement i'm listening but if the news is really so wonderful you surely took your time in bringing it i've been here all evening while you stayed below there trying to increase those fellaheen's stock of ignorance what's the idea oh i prithee you do not let my awayness beget your goat howadji pleaded najib ever sensitive to any hint of reproof from his master it was that which made the grand tidings if i had not have been where i have been this evening and doing what i have done there would not be any tidings at all i made the tidings myself both of them and i made them for you is it that i may now tell them to you howji go ahead abjured kirby humouring the wistful earnestness of the man what's the news you have for me it is more than just a news howji corrected najib with jealous regard for shades of meaning it is a tidings and it is this you and my poor self and the fellaheen and even those hell-selected pashalik soldiers we are all to be rich most especially you howji wealthiness bewaits us all no longer shall any of us be downward and outward from povertude no more shall any of us toil early and belatedly we shall all live in easiness of hours and with much payment inshallah allah dulala he concluded his rising excitement for once bursting the carefully nourished bounds of english and overflowing into arabic expletive noting his own lapse into his native tongue he looked sheepishly at kirby as though hoping the american had not heard the break then with mounting eagerness najib struck the climax of his narrative to speak with a briefness howadji he proclaimed grandiloquently we have all stroked ourselves you've all done what asked the puzzled kirby not we alone howadji amended najib but you also we would not berich ourselves and leave you outward in the plan it is you also who are to stroke yourself and for the love of heaven exclaimed kirby in sudden loss of patience what are you driving at what do you mean about stroking yourselves say it in arabic then perhaps i can find what you mean it is not to be said in the arabic howadji returned najib wincing at this slur on his english for there is not such a thing in arabic as to make strike we make strike thus i say it we stroke ourselves if it is the wrong way of saying it strike repeated kirby perplexed 
What do you mean? Are you still thinking about what I told you today? If you are going... I have bethought of it, Howadji, ever since, was the reply, and it is because of my much bethoughting that I found my splendorous plan. That is my tidings. I bethought it all out with tremendous clearness and wiseness. Then I told those others down yonder. At first they were of a stupidity, for it was so new, but at last I made them understand, and they rejoiced of it so it is all settled most sweetly you may not fear that they will not stand by it as soon as that was made sure i came to you to tell najib groaned kirby his head a-whirl will you stop chewing chunks of indigestible language and tell me what you are jabbering about what was it you thought over and what is all settled what will the strike of an assuredly exclaimed najib as if in pity of his chief's denseness to-night we make strike all of us that is one tiding and you too make strike with us that is the other tiding making two tidings we make strike to-morrow we all sleep late no work is to be made and so it shall be on each dear and nice and happy day until cabel effendi be his sons and hundred and his wives true shall pay us the money we ask and make short our hours of toil then kirby sought to speak but his breath was gone he only gobbled taking the wordless sound for a token of high approval najib hastened on more glibly with his program on the to-morrow's morning howadji he said we enseech that you will write a sorrowsome letter to cabel effendi in the broad street of new york and say to him that all of us have made strike and that we shall work no more until we have from his hands a writing that our payment shall be two mejidi for every mejidi we have been capturing from his company also and likewise that we shall work but half time and that you howadji are to receive even as we save only that your wage is to be in swollen to three times over than what it is now and say to him howadji that unless he does our wish in this striking we shall slay all others whom he may behire in our place and that we shall dynamitely destroy the nice mine remind him howadji if perchancely he does not know of such things that the law is with us say moreoverly that there may be many importance full shipments and contracts just now and say he will lose all if he be so bony of head as to refuse us furthermore howadji tell him i prithee you that we a veritable yell from kirby broke in on the smug instructions the american had recovered enough of his breath to expend a lungful of it in one profane bellow in a flash he visualized the whole scene at the fellaheen's quarters najim's crazy explanation of the strike system and of the supposed immunity from punishment that would follow sabotage and other violence the fellaheen's duller brains gradually seizing on the idea until it had become as much a part of their mucilaginous mentality as the koran itself and najib's friendly desire that kirby might share in the golden benefits of the new scheme yes the american grasped the whole thing at once his knowledge of the east foretelling to him its boundless possibilities for mischief and for the ruin of the mine's new prosperity he fairly strangled with the gust of wrath and impotent amaze which gripped him najib smiled up at him as might a dog that had just performed some pretty new trick or a child who has brought to its father a gift but the aspect of kirby's distorted face there in the dying firelight shocked the syrian into a grunt of terror scrambling to his feet he sputtered quaveringly tame yourself howadji i enseech you why are you not rejoiceful will it not mean much money for you and you mangy brown rat shouted kirby in fury what in blazes have you done you know as well as i do that such an idea will never get out of those fellaheen skulls once it's really planted there they'll believe every word of that wall-eyed rot you've been telling them and they'll go on a genuine strike on the strength of it they'll of an assuredly howadji they will assented the bewildered najib i made me very assured of that four times i told it all over to them until even poor imbarak 
whose wistfulness hath been beblown out of his brain by the breath of the most high until even m barak understood but why it should enrouse you to a lionsome raging i cannot think i bethought you would be pleasured listen to me ordered kirby fighting hard for self-control and forcing himself to speak with unnatural slowness you've done more damage than if you had dynamited the whole mine and then turned a river into the shaft this kind of news spreads in a week there won't be a worker east of the jordan who won't be a strike fan and these people here will work the idea a step farther i know them they'll decide that if one strike is good two strikes are better and they will strike every week loafing between times this prospect brought a grin of pure bliss to najib's swarthy face he looked in new admiration upon his far-sighted chief kirby went on not that that will concern us for this present strike will settle the cabell mine it means ruin to our business here and the loss of all your jobs as well as my own why you idiot can't you see what you've done if you don't take that asinine grin off your ugly face i'll knock it off he burst out his hard-held patience momentarily fraying then taking new hold on his self-control kirby began again to talk as if addressing a defective child which as a matter of fact he was doing he expounded the hideous situation he explained the disloyalty to the cabells of such a move as najib had planned he pointed out the pride he and najib had taken in the new business they had secured for the home office and the fact that this new business had brought an increase of pay to them both as well as to the fellaheen he showed how great a triumph for the mine was this vast increase of business and the stark necessity of impressing the new customers by the promptitude and uniform excellence of all shipments he pointed out the utter collapse to this and to all the rest of the mine's connections which a strike would entail najib listened unmoved hopeless of hammering american ethics into the brain of an oriental kirby set off at a new angle he explained the loss of prestige and position which he himself would suffer he would be discharged probably by cable for allowing the mine's burgeoning prosperity to go to pieces in such a fashion another and less lenient and understanding manager would be sent out to take his place a manager whose first official act would probably be the discharging of najib as the cause of the whole trouble najib listened to this with a new interest but with no great conviction even kirby's declaration that the ridiculous strike be a failure and that the government would assuredly punish any damage done to the cabell property did not serve to impress him najib was a syrian an idea once firm rooted in his mind was loath to let itself be torn thence by mere words kirby waxed desperate you have wrecked this whole thing he stormed you got an idiotically wrong slant on what i told you about the strikes to-day and you have ruined us all even if you should go down there to the quarters this minute and tell the men that you were mistaken and that the strike is off you know they wouldn't believe you and you know they would go straight ahead with the thing that's the oriental of it they'd refuse to go on working and our shipments wouldn't be delivered none of the ore for the next shipments would be mined the men would just hang about peacefully waiting for the double pay and the half-time that you've promised them of oh, an assuredly that is true howard g conceded najib they would they will corrected kirby with grim hopelessness but soon cabell effendi will reply to your letter went on najib and then the double paying to my letter mocked the raging kirby then he paused a sudden inspiration smiting him now jeeb he continued after a minute of concentrated thought you have sense enough to know one thing you have sense enough to know you people can't get that extra pay till i write to mr cabell and demand it for you there's not another one of you who can write english there's no one here but yourself who can speak or understand it or make the shift to spell out a few english words in print and mr cabell doesn't know a word of arabic let alone the arabic script 
and your own two years at coney island must have shown you that no new yorkers would know how to read an arabic letter to him now i swear to you by every christian and moslem oath that i shan't write such a letter so how are you going to get word to him that your people are on strike and that you won't do another lick of work till you get double pay in half time how are you going to do that najib's solid face went blank here at last was an argument that struck home he had known kirby for years long enough to know that the american was most emphatically a man of his word if kirby swore he would not act as the men's intermediary with the company then decisively kirby would keep his oath and najib realized the futility of getting anyone else to write such a letter in any language which the cabell smelting company's home office would decipher he peered up at kirby with disconsolate astonishment quick to take advantage of the change the manager hurried on now the men are on strike that's understood well what are you and they going to do about it when the draft for the monthly payroll comes to the bank at jerusalem as usual i shall refuse to endorse it i give you my oath on that too i am not going to distribute the company's cash among a bunch of strikers without my signature the bank won't cash the draft you know that well how are you going to live all of you on nothing a month when the present stock of provisions gives out i'm not going to order them renewed and the provision people in jerusalem won't honor anyone's order for them but mine this is the only concern in syria today that pays within forty per cent of the wages you chaps are getting with no pay and no food you're due to find your strike rather costly for when the mine shuts down i'm going back to america there'll be nothing to keep me here i'll be ruined in any case you people will find yourself without money or provisions and if you go elsewhere for work it will be at a pay that is only a little more than half what you are getting now your lookout isn't cheery my striking friend he made as though to go into his tent after a brief pause of horror najib pattered hurriedly and beseechingly in his wake how would ye plead the syrian shakily how would ye you would not in the untamefulness of your mad desertion us like that not me at any how not me who have loved you as daoud the emir loved jonathan of old you would not forsake me to starve myself ay ay shut up that ungodly racket snapped kirby entering his tent and lighting his lamp as the first piercing notes of the traditional mourner chant exploded through the unhappy najib's wide-flung jaws shut up you'll start every hyena and jackal in the mountains to howling it's bad enough as it is without adding a native concert to the rest of the mess but how would ye pleaded najib toman growled kirby summarily speaking the age-hallowed arabic word for the ending of all interviews but i shall be ruinated how would ye tearfully insisted najib covertly the american watched his henchman while pretending to make ready for bed if he had fully and permanently scared najib into a conviction that the strike would spell ruin for the syrian himself then the little man's brain might possibly be jarred into one of its rare intervals of uncanny craftiness and najib might hit upon some way of persuading the fellaheen that the strike was off this was kirby's sole hope and he knew it unless the fellaheen could be so convinced it meant the strike would continue until it should break the mine as well as the mine's manager kirby knew of no way to persuade the men the same argument which had crushed najib would mean nothing to them all their brains could master at one time without the aid of some uprooting shock was that henceforth they were to get double pay and half labor a calm fatalism of hopelessness bred perhaps of his long residence in the homeland of fatalism began to creep over kirby in one hour his golden ambitions for the mine and for himself had been smashed at best he saw no hope of getting the obsessed mine crew to work soon enough to save his present contracts he would be lucky if on non-receipt of their demanded increase they did not follow najib's muddled preachments to the point of sabotage 
The more he thought of it, the less possible did it seem to Kirby that Najib could undo the damage he had so blithely done. Ordering the blubbering little fellow out of the tent and refusing to speak or listen further, Kirby went to bed. Oddly enough, he slept. There was nothing to worry about. When a man's job or fortune are imperiled, sleep vanishes. But after the catastrophe, what sense is there in lying awake? Depression and nervous fatigue threw Kirby into a troubled slumber. Only once in the night was he roused. Perhaps two hours before dawn, he started up at sound of a humble scratching at the open door flap of his tent. On the threshold cowered Najib. Furthermore, Howadji, came the Syrian's woe-begone voice through the gloom, could I borrow me a book if I shall use it with much carefulness? Too drowsy to heed the absurdity of such a plea at such an hour, Kirby grumbled a surly assent and dozed again as he heard Najib rumbling in the dark among the shelves of the packing-box bookcase in a far corner of the tent. Here were stored nearly a hundred old volumes which had been a part of the missionary library belonging to Kirby's father at Nablus. A few years earlier, at the moving of the mission, the dead missionary's scanty library had been shipped across country to his son. Kirby awoke at grayest daylight. Through force of habit he awoke at this hour, in spite of the workless day which he knew confronted him. It was his custom to get up and take his bath in the rain cistern at this time, and to finish dressing just as the men piled out for the morning's work. Yet now the first sounds that smote his ears as he opened his eyes were the rhythmic creak of the mine windlass and equally rhythmic, if less tuneful, chant of the men who were working it. Allah Sahid, Nabiya Seed, Ohe, Sahid, Sahid, Sahid. In the distance, dying away, he heard the plodding hoofs of a string of pack mules. From the direction of the mine came the hoodlum racket, which betokens in Syria the efforts of a number of honest laborers to perform their daily tasks in an efficient and orderly way. Kirby, in sleepy amaze, looked at his watch in the dim dawn light. He saw it was still a full half-hour before the men were due to begin work, and by the sounds he judged that the day's labor was evidently well under way. Yes, and today there was to have been no work done. Kirby jumped out of bed and strode dazedly to his tent door. At the mine below him his fellaheen were as busy as so many dirty and gaudy bees. Even the lordly, lazy Turkish soldiers were lending a hand at windlass and crane. Over the nick of the pass, leading toward Jerusalem, the last animal of a mule train was vanishing. Najib, who had as usual escorted the departing shipment of ore to the opening in the pass, was trotting back toward camp. At sight of Kirby, in the tent door, the little superintendent veered from his course toward the mine and increased his pace to a run as he bore down upon the American. Najib's swart face was aglow, but his eyes were those of a man who has neglected to sleep. His cheeks still bore flecks of the dust he had thrown on his head when Kirby had explained the wreck of his scheme and of his future. There, in all likelihood, the dust smears would remain until the next rain should wash them off. But beyond these tokens of recent mental strife, Najib's visage shone like a full moon that is streaked by dun dust clouds. Furthermore, Howadji, he hailed his chief as soon as he was within earshot, the shipment for Alexandretta is on its wayward, over than an hour earlier than it was due to be start itself, and those poor hell-selected fellaheen are betoiling themselves grand. Have I done well, O oh, Howadji? Najib, stammered Kirby, still dazed, and here is that most sweet book of great worthiness and wit which I borrowed me of you in the night, Howadji, pursued Najib, taking from the soiled folds of his abbey a large old volume, bound in stout leather, after the manner of religious or scientific books of a half-century ago. On the brown back a scratched gold lettering proclaimed the gruesome title, Martyrs of Ancient and Modern Error. Well did Kirby know the tome. 
Hundreds of times as a child had he sat on the stone floor of his father's cell-like mission study at Nablus and had pored in shuddering fascination over its highly colored illustrations. The book was a compilation, chiefly in the form of multichrome pictures with accompanying borders of text, of all the grisly scenes of martyrdom which the publishers had been able to scrape together from such classics as Fox's Book of Martyrs and the like. Twice this past year he had surprised Najib scanning the gruesome pages in frank delight. I betook the book to their campfire, Howadji, and I smote upon my breast, and I bewept me, and I bewailed aloud, and I would not make comfort till at last they all awoken and they came out of their huts and they reviled at me for disturbing them as they slept themselves so happily then i spake much to them and all the time i teared with my eyes and moaned loudly but put in kirby i don't see what this in a presently you shall howadji yesterday i begot your goat to-day i shall make you to frisk with peacefulness of heart those fellaheen cannot read they are not of an education as i am and they know my wiseness in reading for over than a trillion times i have told them and they believe pictures also they believe just as men of an education believe the printed word knowing full well it could not be printed if it were not allah's own truth well these folk believe a picture if it be in a book so i showed them pictures and i read the law which was beneath the pictures they heard me read and they saw the pictures with their own eyesight so what could they do but believe and they did behold howadji opening the volume with respectful care najib thumbed the yellowing pages presently he paused at a picture which represented in glaring detail a stricken battlefield strewn with dead and dying orientals of vivid costume in the middle distance a regiment of prisoners was being slaughtered in a singularly bloodthirsty fashion the caption above the cut read destruction of sennacherib's assyrian hosts by the people of israel while yet they gazed joyingly on this noble picture remarked najib i read to them the words of the law about it i read aloudly thus this shall be the way of punishing all folk who make strike hereafter this date then continued najib i showed to them another pretty and splendid picture see martyrdom of john rogers his wife and their nine children and proclaimed najib of this sweet portrait i read thus the law so shall the wives and the offsprungs of all strike makers be put to death and those wicked strike makers themselves along with them by the time i had shown them six or fifteen of such pictures and read them the law for each of them those miserable fellaheen and guards were beweeping themselves harder and louder and sadder than i had seemed to why howadji it was with a difficultness that i kept them from running away and in hiding themselves in the mountains lest the soldiers of the pasha come upon them at once and punish them for trying to make strike but i said i would intercede with you to make you merciful of heart toward them to spare them and not to tell the law what they had so sinsomelessly planned to do i said i would do this for mine own sake as well as for theirs and that i knew i could wake you to pity but i said it would perchancely soften your heart toward them if all should work harder to atone themselves for the sin they had be plotted wherefore howadji they would consent to sleep no more but they ran henceforthly and at once to the mine they have been on to the job ever since and howadji they are jobbing harder than ever i have seen men be jobbed themselves am i forgiven howadji he finished timidly forgiven yelled kirby when he could speak why you eternal little liar you're a genius my hat is off to you this ought to be worth a fifty medjidi bonus and instead of the bonus howadji ventured najib scared at his own audacity yet seeking to take full advantage of this moment of expansiveness could i have this pleasing book as a bakshish gift take it vouchsafed kirby the thing gives me bad dreams take it may the ouries make soft your bed in the paradise of the prophet 
jabbered Najib in a frenzy of gratitude as he hugged the treasured gift to his breast. And, and Howadji, there be more pictures I did not show. They will be of a nice convenience if ever again it be needsome to make a new law for the mine. But, oh, happy and pretty decent hour, chortled the little man, petting his beloved volume, as if it were a beloved child, and executing a shuffling and improvised step-dance of unalloyed rapture this book has been donationed to me because i was brave enough to request for it while yet your heart was warm at me howadji it is even as your sainted feringhi proverb says never put off till to-morrow the uh, the man who may be done to-day end of story four Story 5 of O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Stories of 1919 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 5, The Elephant Remembers by Edison Marshall from Everybody's Magazine. An elephant is old on the day he is born, say the natives of Burma, and no white man is ever quite sure just what they mean perhaps they refer to his pink old gentleman's skin and his droll fumbling old man ways and his squeaking treble voice and maybe they mean he is born with a wisdom such as usually belongs only to age and it is true that if any animal in the world has had a chance to acquire knowledge it is the elephant for his breed are the oldest residents of this old world they are so old that they don't seem to belong to the twentieth century at all their long trunks their huge shapes all seem part of the remote past they are just the remnants of a breed that once was great long and long ago when the world was very young indeed when the mountains were new and before the descent of the great glaciers taught the meaning of cold they were the rulers of the earth but they have been conquered in the struggle for existence their great cousins the mastodon and the mammoth are completely gone and their own tribe can now be numbered by thousands but because they have been so long upon the earth because they have wealth of experience beyond all other creatures they seem like venerable sages in the world of children they are like the last veterans of an old war who can remember scenes and faces that all others have forgotten far in a remote section of british india in a strange wild province called burma mustag was born and although he was born in captivity the property of a mahout in his first hour he heard the far-off call of the wild elephants in the jungle the burmans just like the other people of india always watched the first hour of a baby's life very closely they know that always some incident will occur that will point as a weather vane points in the wind to the baby's future often they have to call a man versed in magic to interpret but sometimes the prophecy is quite self-evident no one knows whether or not it works the same with baby elephants but certainly this wild far-carrying call not to be imitated by any living voice did seem a token and an omen in the life of mustag and it is a curious fact that the little baby lifted his ears at the sound and rocked back and forth on his pillar legs of all the places in the great world only a few remain wherein a captive elephant hears the call of his wild brethren at birth mustag's birthplace lies around the corner of the bay of bengal not far from the watershed of the irrawaddy almost north of java it is strange and wild and dark beyond the power of words to tell there are great dark forests unknown slow-moving rivers and jungles silent and dark and impenetrable little mustag weighed a flat two hundred pounds at birth but this was not the queerest thing about him elephant babies although usually weighing not more than one hundred and eighty often touch two hundred the queerest thing was a peculiarity that probably was completely overlooked by his mother if she saw it out of her dull eyes she took no notice of it it was not definitely discovered until the mahout came out of his hut with a lighted faggot for a first inspection he had been wakened by the sound of the mother's pain ay he had exclaimed to his wife 
Who has ever heard a cow bawl so loud in labor? The little one that tomorrow you will see beneath her belly must weigh more than you. This was rather a compliment to his plump wife. She was not offended at all. Burman women love to be well-rounded, but the mahout was not weighing the effect of his words. He was busy lighting his firebrand, and his features seemed sharp and intent when the beams came out. Rather, he was already weighing the profits of little Mustag. He was an elephant catcher by trade in the employ of the great white Dugan Sahib, and the cow that was at this moment bringing a son into the world was his own property. If the baby should be of the Kumiria, the Mahout knew elephants from head to tail, and he was very well acquainted with the three grades that compose the breed. The least valuable of all are the Mirga, a light, small-headed, thin-skinned, weak-trunked, and unintelligent variety that are often found in the best elephant herds. They are often born of the most noble parents, and they are as big a problem to elephant men as razorbacks to hog breeders. Then there is a second variety, the Dwasala, that compose the great bulk of the herd, a good, substantial, strong, intelligent grade of elephant. But the Kumiria is the best of all, and when one is born in a captive herd, it is a time for rejoicing. He is the perfect elephant heavy, symmetrical, trustworthy, and fearless, fitted for the pageantry of kings. He hurried out to the lines, for now he knew that the baby was born. The mother's cries had ceased. The jungle, dark and savage, beyond ever the power of man to tame, lay just beyond. He could feel its heavy air and its smells. Its silence was an essence, and as he stood lifting the faggot high, he heard the wild elephants trumpeting from the hills. He turned his head in amazement. A Burman, and particularly one who chases the wild elephants in their jungles, is intensely superstitious, and for an instant it seemed to him that the wild trumpeting must have some secret meaning, it was so loud and triumphant and prolonged. It was greatly like the far-famed elephant salute ever one of the mysteries of those most mysterious of animals that the great creatures utter at certain occasions and times. "'Are you saluting this little one?' he cried. "'He is not a wild tusker like you. He is not a wild pig of the jungle. He is born in bonds, such as you will wear too after the next drive.' They trumpeted again, as if in scorn of his words. Their great strength was given them to rule the jungle, not to haul logs and pull chains. The man turned back to the lines and lifted higher his light. Yes, the little elephant in the light glow was of the Kumiria. Never had there been a more perfect calf. The light of greed sprang again in his eyes, and as he held the faggot nearer so that the beams played in the elephant's eyes and on his coat, the mahout sat down and was still lest the gods observe his good luck, and being jealous, turn it into evil. The coat was not pinky dark, as is usual in baby elephants. It was distinctly light-colored, only a few degrees darker than white. The man understood at once. In the elephants, as well as in all other breeds, an albino is sometimes born. A perfectly white elephant, up to a few years ago, had never been seen but on rare occasions elephants are born with light-colored or clouded hides. Such creatures are bought at fabulous prices by the Malay and Siamese princes, to whom a white elephant is the greatest treasure that a king can possess. Mustag was a long way from being an albino, yet a tendency in that direction had bleached his hide, and the man knew that on the morrow Dugan Sahib would pay him a lifetime's earnings for the little wobbly calf whose welcome had been the wild cries of the tuskers in the jungle. 2. Little Mustag, which means White Mountain in an ancient tongue, did not enjoy his babyhood at all. He was born with the memory of jungle kingdoms, and the life in the elephant lines almost killed him with dullness. There was never anything to do but nurse of the strong elephant milk and roam about in the keda or along the lines. He had been bought the second day of his life by Dugan Sahib, 
and the great white heaven-born saw to it that he underwent none of the risks that are the happy fate of most baby elephants his mother was not taken on the elephant drives into the jungles so he never got a taste of this exciting sport mostly she was kept chained in the lines and every day longer das the low caste hillman in dugan's employ grubbed grass for her in the valleys all night long except the regular four hours of sleep he would hear her grumble and rumble and mutter discontent that her little son shared with her Mustag's second year was little better of course he had reached the age where he could eat such dainties as grass and young sugar-cane but these things could not make up for the fun he was missing in the hills he would stand long hours watching their purple tops against the skies and his little dark eyes would glow he would see the storms break and flash above them behold the rains lashed down through the jungles and he was always filled with strange longings and desires that he was too young to understand or to follow he would see the white hay steam up from the labyrinth of wet vines and he would tingle and scratch for the feel of its wetness on his skin and often when the mysterious burman night came down it seemed to him that he would go mad he would hear the wild tuskers trumpeting in the jungles a very long way off and all the myriad noises of the mysterious night and at such times even his mother looked at him with wonder oh little restless one longer das would say thou and that old cow thy mother and i have one heart between us we know the burning we understand we three it was true that longer das understood more of the ways of the forest people than any other hillman in the encampment but his caste was low and he was drunken and careless and lazy beyond words and the hunters had mostly only scorn for him they called him longer after a grey-bearded breed of monkeys along the slopes of the himalayas rather suspecting he was cursed with evil spirits for why should any sane man have such mad ideas as to the rights of elephants he never wanted to join in the drives which was a strange thing indeed for a man raised in the hills perhaps he was afraid but yet they could remember a certain day in the bamboo thickets when a great wild buffalo had charged their camp and langer das acted as if fear were something he had never heard of and knew nothing whatever about one day they asked him about it tell us langer das they asked mocking the ragged dejected looking creature if thy name speaks true thou art brother to many monkey folk and who knows the jungle better than thou or they none but the monkey folk and thou canst talk with my lord the elephant hi we have seen thee do it langer das how is it that when we go hunting thou art afraid to come langer looked at them out of his dull eyes and evaded their question just as long as he could have you forgotten the tales you heard on your mother's breast he asked at last elephants are of the jungle you are of the cooking pots and thatch how could such folk as ye are understand this was flat heresy from their viewpoint there is an old legend among the elephant catchers to the effect that at one time men were subject to the elephants yet mostly the elephants that these men knew were patient and contented in their bonds mostly they loved their mahouts gave their strong backs willingly to toil and were always glad and ready to join in the chase after others of their breed only on certain nights of the year when the tuskers called from the jungle and the spirit of the wild was abroad would their love of liberty return to them but to all this little mustag was distinctly an exception even though he had been born in captivity his desire for liberty was with him just as constantly as his trunk or his ears he had no love for the mahout that rode his mother he took little interest in the little brown boys and girls that played before his stall he would stand and look over their heads into the wild dark heart of the jungle that no man can ever quite understand and being only a beast he did not know anything about the caste and prejudices of the men he saw but he did know that one of them the low caste langer das ragged and dirty and despised wakened a responsive chord in his lonely heart 
They would have long talks together, that is, Langer would talk and Mustag would mumble. Little calf, little fat one, the man would say, can great rocks stop a tree from growing? Shall iron shackles stop a prince from being king? Mustag, jewel among jewels, thy heart speaks through those sleepless eyes of thine. Have patience, what thou knowest, who shall take away from thee? But most of the mahouts and catchers noticed the rapidity with which the little Mustag acquired weight and strength. He outweighed at the age of three any calf of his season in the encampment by a full two hundred pounds. And, of course, three in an elephant is no older than three in a human child. He was still just a baby, even if he did have the wild tusker's love of liberty. Shalt thou never lie the day long in the cool mud, little one? Never see a storm break on the hills, nor feel a warm rain dripping through the branches? Or are these matters part of thee that none may steal? Langer Das would ask him, contented to wait a very long time for his answer. I think already that thou knowest how the tiger steals away at thy shrill note, how thickets feel that crash beneath thy hurrying weight. A little, I think, thou knowest how the madness comes with the changing seasons. How knowest thou these things? Not as I know them, who have seen. Nay, but as a king knows conquering, it's in thy blood. Is a bundle of sugar-cane tribute enough for thee, Kumiria? Shall purple trappings please thee? Shall some fat raja of the plains make a beast of burden of thee? Answer, lord of mighty memories. And Mustag answered in his own way, without sound or emphasis, but giving his love to Langer Das, a love as large as the big elephant heart from which it had sprung. No other man could even win his friendship. The smell of the jungle was on Langer Das. The mahouts and hunters smelt more or less of civilization, and were convinced for their part that the disposition of the little light-colored elephant was beyond redemption. He is a born rogue, was their verdict, and they meant by that a particular kind of elephant, sometimes a young male, more often an old and savage tusker alone in the jungle apart from the herd. Solitariness doesn't improve their dispositions, and they were generally expelled from a herd for ill temper to begin with. Woe to the fool prince who buys this one, said the greybeard catchers. There is murder in his eyes. But Langer Das would only look wise when he heard these remarks. He knew elephants. The gleam in the dark eyes of Mustag was not viciousness, but simply inheritance, a love of the wild, wild spaces that left no room for ordinary friendships. But calf love and mother love bind other animals as well as men, and possibly he might have perfectly fulfilled the plans Dugan had made for him, but for a mistake the sahib made in the little calf's ninth year. He sold Mustag's mother to an elephant breeder from a distant province. Little Mustag saw her march away between two tuskers down the long elephant trail into the valley and shadow. Watch the little one closely tonight, Dugan Sahib said to his mahout. So when they had led him back and forth along the lines, they saw that the ends of his ropes were pegged down tightly. They were horsehair ropes, far beyond the strength of any normal nine-year-old elephant to break. Then they went to the huts and to their women, and left him to shift restlessly from foot to foot and think. Probably he would have been satisfied with thinking, for Mustag did not know his strength and thought he was securely tied. The incident that upset the Mahout's plans was simply that the wild elephants trumpeted again from the hills. Mustag heard the sound long drawn and strange from the silence of the jungle. He grew motionless. The great ears pricked forward. The whipping tail stood still. It was a call never to be denied the blood was leaping in his great veins he suddenly rocked forward with all his strength the rope spun tight hummed and snapped very softly indeed then he padded in silence out among the huts and nobody who had not seen him do it would believe how silently an elephant can move when he sees fit there was no thick jungle here, just soft grass huts approaching dark fringe that was jungle. 
None of the mahouts was awake to see him. No voice called them back. The grass gave way to bamboo thickets, the smell of the huts to the wild, bewitching perfumes of the jungle. Then, still in silence, because there were decencies to be observed by animals no less than men, he walked forward with his trunk outstretched into the primordial jungle and was born again. 3. Muztagh's reception was cordial from the very first. The great bulls of the herd stood still and lifted their ears when they heard him grunting up the hill. But he slipped among them and was forgotten at once. They had no dealings with the princes of Malay and Siam, and his light-colored coat meant nothing whatever to them. If they did any thinking about him at all, it was just to wonder why a calf with all the evident marks of a nine-year-old should be so tall and weigh so much. One can fancy that the great old wrinkled tusker that led the herd peered at him now and then out of his little red eyes and wondered. A herd leader begins to think about future contestants for his place as soon as he acquires the leadership. But hi, this little one would not have his greatest strength for fifteen years. It was a compact, medium-sized herd. Vast males, mothers, old maid elephants, long-legged and ungainly, young males just learning their strength and proud of it beyond words, and many calves. They ranged all the way in size from the great leader, who stood ten feet and weighed nearly nine thousand pounds, to little two hundred and fifty-pound babies that had been born that season. And before long the entire herd began its cautious advance into the deeper hills. The first night in the jungle, and Mustag found it wonderful past all dreams. The mist on his skin was the same cool joy he had expected. There were sounds, too, that set his great muscles a-quiver. He heard the sound that the bamboos make, the little click-click of the stems in the wind, the soft rustle and stir of many leafy tendrils entwining and touching together, and the whisper of the wind over the jungle grass. And he knew, because it was his heritage, what every single one of these sounds meant. The herd threaded through the dark jungle, and now they descended into a cool river. A herd of deer, either the dark sambor or black buck, sprang from the misty shoreline and leaped away into the bamboos. Farther down he could hear the grunt of buffalo. It was simply a caress, the touch of the soft, cool water on his flanks. Then they reared out like great sea-gods rising from the deep and grunted and squealed their way up the banks into the jungle again. But the smells were the book that he read best. He understood them even better than the sounds of green things growing. Flowers that he could not see hung like bells from the arching branches. Every fern and every seeding grass had its own scent that told sweet tales. The very mud that his four feet sank into emitted scent that told the history of jungle life from the world's beginnings. When dawn burst over the eastern hills, he was weary in every muscle of his young body, but much too happy to admit it. This day was just the first of three thousand joyous days. The jungle, old as the world itself, is ever new. Not even the wisest elephant, who after all is king of the jungle, knows what will turn up in the next bend in the elephant trail. It may be a native woodcutter, whose long hair is stirred with fright, it may easily be one of the great breed of bears, large as the American grizzly, that some naturalists believe are to be found in the Siamese and Burman jungles. It may be a herd of wild buffalo, always looking for a fight, or simply some absurd armadillo-like thing to make him shake his vast sides with mirth. The herd was never still. They ranged from one mysterious hill to another, to the ranges of the Himalayas and back again. There were no rivers that they did not swim, no jungles that they did not penetrate, no elephant trails that they did not follow in the whole northeastern corner of British India. And all the time Mustag's strength grew upon him until it became too vast a thing to measure or control. Whether or not he kept with the herd was by now a matter of supreme indifference to him. He no longer needed its protection. 
Except for the men who came with the ropes and guns and shoutings, there was nothing in the jungle for him to fear. He was twenty years old, and he stood nearly eleven feet to the top of his shoulders. He would have broken any scales in the Indian Empire that tried to weigh him. He had had his share of adventures, yet he knew that life in reality had just begun. The time would come when he would want to fight the great arrogant bull for the leadership of the herd. He was tired of fighting the young bulls of his own age. He always won, and to an elephant constant winning is almost as dull as constant losing. He was a great deal like a youth of twenty in any breed of any land, light-hearted, self-confident, enjoying every minute of wakefulness between one midnight and another. He loved the jungle smells and the jungle sounds, and he could even tolerate the horrible laughter of the hyenas that sometimes tore to shreds the silence of the grassy plains below. But India is too thickly populated by human beings for a wild elephant to escape observation entirely. Many natives had caught sight of him, and at last the tales reached a little circle of trackers and hunters in camp on a distant range of hills. They did not work for Dugan Sahib, for Dugan Sahib was dead long since. They were a determined little group, and one night they sat and talked softly over their fire. If Muztagh's ears had been sharp enough to hear their words across the space of hills, he would not have gone to his mud baths with such complacency the next day. But the space between them was fifty miles of sweating jungle, and of course he did not hear. "'You will go, Kuzru, said the leader, for there are none here half so skillful with horsehair rope as you. If you do not come back within twelve months, we shall know you have failed.' Of course, all of them knew what he meant. If a man failed in the effort to capture a wild elephant by the hair-rope method, he very rarely lived to tell of it. In that case, Ahmad Din went on, there will be a great drive after the monsoon of next year. Picked men will be chosen. No detail will be overlooked. It will cost more, but it will be sure, and our purses will be fat from the selling price of this king of elephants with a white coat. Four. There is no need to follow Kusru on his long pursuit through the elephant trails. He was an able hunter, and after the manner of the elephant trackers, the scared little man followed Muztak through jungle and river, over hill and into dale, for countless days, and at last, as Muztak slept, he crept up within a half-dozen feet of him. He intended to loop a horsehair rope around his great feet one of the oldest and most hazardous methods of elephant catching, but Muztagh awakened just in time. And then a curious thing happened. The native could never entirely believe it, and it was one of his best stories to the day he died. Any other wild tusker would have charged in furious wrath, and there would have been a quick and certain death beneath his great knees. Muztagh started out as if he had intended to charge, he lifted his trunk out of the way. The elephant trunk is for a thousand uses, but fighting is not one of them, and sprang forward. He went just two paces. Then his little eyes caught sight of the brown figure fleeing through the bamboos, and at once the elephant set his great feet to break himself and drew to a sliding halt six feet beyond. He did not know why. He was perfectly aware that this man was an enemy, jealous of his most loved liberty. He knew perfectly it was the man's intention to put him back into his bonds. He did not feel fear, either, because an elephant's anger is too tremendous an emotion to leave room for any other impulse such as fear. It seemed to him that memories came thronging from long ago, so real and insistent that he could not think of charging. He remembered his days in the elephant lines. These brown creatures had been his masters then. They had cut his grass for him in the jungle and brought him bundles of sugar cane. The hill people say that the elephant memory is the greatest single marvel in the jungle, and it was that memory that saved Kusru then. It wasn't deliberate gratitude for the grass cutting of long ago. It wasn't any particular emotion that he could reach out his trunk and touch. It was simply an impulse, another one of the thousand mysteries that envelop 
like a cloud the mental processes of these largest of forest creatures these were the days when he lived apart from the herd he did it from choice he liked the silence the solitary mud baths the constant watchfulness against danger one day a rhino charged him without warning or reason this is quite a common thing for a rhino to do they have the worst tempers in the jungle and they would just as soon charge a mountain if they didn't like the look of it Mustag had awakened the great creature from his sleep and he came bearing down like a tank over no man's land Mustag met him squarely with the full shock of his tusks and the battle ended promptly Mustag's tusk driven by five tons of might behind it would have pierced a ship's side and the rhino limped away to let his hurt grow well and meditate revenge thereafter for a full year he looked carefully out of his bleary drunken eyes and chose a smaller objective before he charged month after month Mustag wended alone through the elephant trails and now and then rooted up great trees just to try his strength sometimes he went silently and sometimes like an avalanche he swam alone in the deep holes and sometimes shut his eyes and stood on the bottom just keeping the end of his trunk out of the water one day he was obliged to kneel on the broad back of an alligator who tried to bite off his foot he drove the long body down into the muddy bottom and no living creature except possibly the catfish that burrow in the mud ever saw it again he loved the rains that flashed through the jungle, the swift climbing dawns in the east, the strange, tense, breathless nights, and at midnight he loved to trumpet to the herd on some faraway hill, and hear, fainter than the death cry of a beetle, its answer come back to him. At twenty-five he had reached full maturity, and no more magnificent specimen of the elephant could be found in all of British India. At last he had begun to learn his strength. Of course, he had known for years his mastery over the inanimate things of the world. He knew how easy it was to tear a tree from its roots, to jerk a great tree limb from its socket. He knew that under most conditions he had nothing to fear from the great tigers, although a fight with a tiger is a painful thing and well to avoid. But he did not know that he had developed a craft and skill that would avail him in battle against the greatest of his own kind he made the discovery one sunlit day beside the manipur river he was in the mud bath grunting and bubbling with content it was a bath with just room enough for one and seeing that he was young and perhaps failing to measure his size obscured as it was in the mud a great rogue bull came out of the jungle to take the bath for himself he was a huge creature wrinkled and yellow-tusked and scarred from the wounds of a thousand fights his little red eyes looked out malignantly and he grunted all the insults the elephant tongue can compass to the youngster that lolled in the bath he confidently expected that Mustag would yield at once because as a rule young twenty-five-year-olds do not care to mix in battle with the scarred and crafty veterans of sixty years but he did not know Mustag. The latter had been enjoying the bath to the limit, and he had no desire whatever to give it up. Something hot and raging seemed to explode in his brain, and it was as if a red glare, such as sometimes comes in the sunset, had fallen over all the stretch of river and jungle before his eyes. He squealed once, reared up with one lunge out of the bath, and charged. They met with a shock of all the expressions of power in the animal world the elephant fight is the most terrible to see it is as if two mountains rose up from their roots of strata and went to war it is terrible to hear too the jungle had been still before the river glided softly the wind was dead the mid-afternoon silence was over the thickets the jungle people were asleep a thunderstorm would not have broken more quickly or could not have created a wilder pandemonium the jungle seemed to shiver with the sound they squealed and bellowed and trumpeted and grunted and charged their tusks clicked like the noise of a giant's game of billiards the thickets cracked and broke beneath their great feet it lasted only a moment 
It was so easy, after all. In a very few seconds, indeed, the old rogue became aware that he had made a very dangerous and disagreeable mistake. There were better mud baths on the river anyway. He had not been able to land a single blow and his wrath gave way to startled amazement when Mustag sent home his third. The rogue did not wait for the fourth. Mustag chased him into the thickets, but he was too proud to chase a beaten elephant for long. He halted, trumpeting, and swung back to his mud bath. But he did not enter the mud again. All at once he remembered the herd and the fights of his calfhood. All at once he knew that his craft and strength and power were beyond that of any elephant in all the jungle. Who was the great arrogant herd leader to stand against him? What yellow tusks were to meet his and come away unbroken? His little eyes grew ever more red as he stood rocking back and forth, his trunk lifted to catch the sounds and smells of the distant jungle. Why should he abide alone when he could be the ruler of the herd and the jungle king? Then he grunted softly and started away down the river. Far away beyond the mountains and rivers and the village of the hill folk, the herd of his youth roamed in joyous freedom. He would find them and assert his mastery. 5. The night fire of a little band of elephant catchers burned fitfully at the edge of the jungle. They were silent men, for they had lived long on the elephant trails, and curiously scarred and somber. They smoked their cheroots and waited for Ahmed Din to speak. "'You have all heard?' he asked at last. All but one of them nodded. Of course this did not count the most despised one of them all, old Langer Das, who sat at the very edge of the shadow. His long hair was gray, and his youth had gone where the sun goes at evening. They scarcely addressed a word to him, or he to them. True, he knew the elephants, but was he not possessed of evil spirits? He was always without rupees, too, a creature of the wild that could not seem to understand the gathering of money. As a man, according to the standards of men, he was an abject failure. Kuzru has failed to catch White Skin, but he has lived to tell many lies about it. He comes to-night. It was noticeable that Langer Das, at the edge of the circle, pricked up his ears. "'Do you mean the white elephant of which the Manipur people tell so many lies?' he asked. "'Do you, skilled catchers that you are, believe that such an elephant is still wild in the jungle?' Ahmad Din scowled. "'The Manipur people tell of him, but for once they tell the truth,' was the reply. "'He is the greatest elephant, the richest prize in all of Burma.' Too many people have seen him to doubt. I add my word to theirs, thou son of immorality. Ahmed Din hesitated before he continued. Perhaps it was a mistake to tell of the great light-colored elephant until this man should have gone away. But what harm could this wanderer do them? All men knew that the jungle had maddened him. Langer Das's face lit suddenly. Then it could be none but Mustag escaped from Dugan Zaib fifteen years ago. That calf was also white. He was also overgrown for his years. One of the trackers suddenly gasped. Then that is why he spared Kusru, he cried. He remembered men. The others nodded gravely. They never forget, said Langer Das. You will be silent while I speak, Ahmed Den went on. Langer grew silent as commanded, but his thoughts were flowing backward twenty years to days at the elephant lines in the distant hills. Mustak was the one living creature that in all his days had loved Langer Das. The man shut his eyes and his limbs seemed to relax as if he had lost all interest in the talk. The evil one took hold of him at such times, the people said letting understanding follow his thoughts back into the purple hills and the far-off spaces of the jungle but to-night he was only pretending he meant to hear every word of the talk before he left the circle he tells a mad story as you know of the elephant sparing him when he was beneath his feet ahmed din went on that part of his story does not matter to us Hi, he might have been frightened enough to say that the sun set at noon but what matters to us more is that he knows where the herd is but a day's journey beyond the river 
and there is no time to be lost. His fellows nodded in agreement. So tomorrow we will break camp. There can be no mistake this time. There must be no points overlooked. The chase will cost much, but it will return a hundredfold. Kuzru says that at last the white one has started back toward his herd, so that all can be taken in the same keda. And the white sahib that holds the license is not to know that white coat is in the herd at all. The circle nodded again and contracted toward the speaker. We will hire beaters and drivers, the best that can be found. Tomorrow we will take the elephants and go. Longer Das pretended to awaken. I have gone hungry many days, he said. If the drive is on, perhaps you will give your servant a place among the beaters. The circle turned and stared at him. It was one of the stories of Longer Das that he never partook in the elephant hunts. Evidently, poor living had broken his resolutions you shall have your wish if you know how to keep a closed mouth ahmed din replied there are other hunting parties in the hills longer nodded he was very adept indeed at keeping a closed mouth it is one of the first lessons of the jungle for another long hour they sat and perfected their plans then they lay down by the fire together and sleep dropped over them one by one at last Langer sat by the fire alone. "'You will watch the flame to-night,' Ahmed Din ordered. "'We did not feed you to-night for pity on your gray hairs. And remember, a gypsy died in a tiger's claws on this very slope, not six months past.' Langer Das was left alone with his thoughts. Soon he got up and stole out into the velvet darkness. The mists were over the hills, as always. "'Have I followed the tales of your greatness all these years for this?' he muttered. "'It is right for pigs with the hearts of pigs to break their backs in labor. But you, my Muztagh, jewel among elephants, king of the jungle, thou art of the true breed. Moreover, I am minded that thy heart and mine are one. Thou art born ten thousand years after thy time, Muztagh, he went on, thou art of the breed of masters not of slaves we are of the same womb thou and i can i not understand these are not my people these brown men about the fire i have not thy strength muztag or i would be out there with thee yet is not the saying that brother shall serve brother he turned slowly back to the circle of the firelight then his brown scrawny fingers clenched Am I to desert my brother in his hour of need? Am I to see these brown pigs put chains around him in the moment of his power? A king falling to the place of a slave. Mustag, we will see what can be done. Mustag, my king, my pearl, my pink baby, for whom I dug grass in the long ago. Thy longer dos is old, and his whole strength is not that of thy trunk and men look at him as a worm in the grass but hi perhaps thou wilt find him an ally not to be despised six the night had just fallen moist and heavy over the jungle when muztagh caught up with his herd he found them in an open grassy glade encircled by hills and they were all waiting silent as he sped down the hills toward them they had heard him coming a long way he was not attempting silence the jungle people had not got out of his way the old bull that led the herd seventy years of age and at the pride of his wisdom and strength scarred yellow tusk and noble past any elephant patriarch in the jungle curled up his trunk when he saw him come he knew very well what would happen and because no one knows better than the jungle people what a good thing it is to take the offensive in all battles, and because it was fitting his place and dignity, he uttered the challenge himself. The silence dropped as something from the sky. The little pink calves, who had never seen the herd grow still in this same way before, felt the dawn of the storm that they could not understand, and took shelter beneath their mother's bellies. But they did not squeal. The silence was too deep for them to dare to break. It is always an epoch in the life of the herd when a young bull contests for leadership. It is a much more serious thing than in the herds of deer and buffalo. The latter only live a handful of years, then grow weak and die. 
a great bull who has attained strength and wisdom enough to obtain the leadership of an elephant herd may often keep it for forty years kings do not rise and fall half so often as in the kingdoms of europe for as most men know an elephant is not really old until he has seen a hundred summers come and go then he will linger fifty years more wise and gray and wrinkled and strange and full of memories of a time no man can possibly remember long years had passed since the leader's place had been questioned the aristocracy of strength is drawn on quite inflexible lines it would have been simply absurd for an elephant of the dwasala or mierga grades to covet the leadership they had grown old without making the attempt only the great kumiria the grand dukes in the aristocracy had ever made the trial at all and besides the bull was a better fighter after thirty years of leadership than on the day he had gained the honor the herd stood like heroic figures in stone for a long moment until muztagh had replied to the challenge he was so surprised that he couldn't make any sound at all at first he had expected to do the challenging himself the fact that the leader had done it shook his self-confidence to some slight degree evidently the old leader still felt able to handle any young and arrogant bulls that desired his place then the herd began to shift the cows drew back with their calves the bulls surged forward and slowly they made a hollow ring not greatly different from the pugilistic ring known to fight fans the calves began to squeal but their mothers silenced them very slowly and grandly with infinite dignity muztagh stamped into the circle his tusks gleamed his eyes glowed red and those appraising old bulls in the ring knew that such an elephant had not been born since the time of their grandfathers they looked him over from tail to trunk they marked the symmetrical form the legs like mighty pillars the sloping back the wide apart intelligent eyes his shoulders were an expression of latent might power to break a tree trunk at its base by the conformity of his muscles he was agile and quick as a tiger and knowing these things and recognizing them and honoring them devotees of strength that they were they threw their trunks in the air till they touched their foreheads and blared their full-voiced salute they gave it the same instant as musicians strike the same note at their leader's signal it was a perfect explosion of sound a terrible blare that crashed out through the jungle and wakened every sleeping thing the dew fell from the trees a great tawny tiger lingering in hope of an elephant calf slipped silently away the sound rang true and loud to the surrounding hills and echoed and re-echoed softer and softer until it was just a tiny tremor in the air not only the jungle folk marveled at the sound at an encampment three miles distant ahmed din and his men heard the wild call and looked with wondering eyes upon each other then out of the silence spoke langur das my lord muztagh has come back to his herd that is his salute he said ahmed din looked darkly about the circle and how long shall he stay he asked the trap was mostly ready the hour to strike had almost come meanwhile the grand old leader stamped into the circle seeming unconscious of the eyes upon him battle-scarred and old even if this fight were his last he meant to preserve his dignity again the salute sounded shattering out like a thunderclap over the jungle then challenger and challenged closed at first the watchers were silent then as the battle grew ever fiercer and more terrible they began to grunt and squeal surging back and forth stamping the earth and crashing the underbrush all the jungle folk for miles about knew what was occurring and ahmed din wished his kedah were completed for never could there be a better opportunity to surround the herd than at the present moment when they had forgotten all things except the battling monsters in the centre of the ring the two bulls were quite evenly matched the patriarch knew more of fighting had learned more wiles but he had neither the strength nor the agility of muztagh 
the late twilight deepened into the intense dark, and the stars of midnight rose above the eastern hills. All at once Mustag went to his knees, but as might a tiger, he sprang aside in time to avoid a terrible tusk-blow to his shoulder, and his counter-blow, a lashing cut with the head, shattered the great leader to the earth. The elephants bounded forward, but the old leader had a trick left in his trunk. As Mustag bore down upon him, he reared up beneath and almost turned the tables. Only the youngster's superior strength saved him from immediate defeat. But as the night drew to morning, the bulls began to see that the tide of the battle had turned. Youth was conquering, too mighty and agile to resist. The rushes of the patriarch were ever weaker. He still could inflict punishment, and the hides of both of them were terrible to see, but he was no longer able to take advantage of his openings. Then Mustag did a thing that reassured the old bulls as to his craft and wisdom. Just as a pugilist will invite a blow to draw his opponent within range, Mustag pretended to leave his great shoulder exposed. The old bull failed to see the plot. He bore down, and Mustag was ready with flashing tusk. What happened thereafter occurred too quickly for the eyes of the elephants to follow. They saw the great bull go down, and Mustag stand lunging above him, and the battle was over. The great leader, seriously hurt, backed away into the shadowed jungle. His trunk was lowered in token of defeat. Then the ring was empty, except for a great red-eyed elephant, whose hide was no longer white, standing blaring his triumph to the stars. Three times the elephant salute crashed out into the jungle silence, the full-voiced salaam to a new king. Muztagh had come into his birthright. 7. The Kadah was built at last. It was a strong stockade, opening with great wings spreading out one hundred yards, and equipped with the great gate that lowered like a portcullis at the funnel end of the wings. The herd had been surrounded by the drivers and beaters, and slowly they had been driven, for long days, toward the Kadah mouth. They had guns loaded with blank cartridges and firebrands ready to light. At a given signal they would close down quickly about the herd, and stampeded into the yawning mouth of the stockade. No detail had been overlooked, no expense had been spared. The profit was assured in advance, not only from the matchless Mustag, but from the herd as well. The king of the jungle, free now as the winds or the waters, was about to go back to his chains. These had been such days. He had led the herd through the hills and had known the rapture of living as never before. It had been his work to clear the trail of all dangers for the herd. It was his pride to find them the coolest watering places, the greenest hills. One night a tiger had tried to kill a calf that had wandered from its mother's side. Mustag lifted his trunk high and charged down with great driving strides, four tons and over of majestic wrath. The tiger leaped to meet him, but the elephant was ready. He had met tigers before. He avoided the terrible stroke of outstretched claws, and his tusks lashed to one side as the tiger was in mid-spring. Then he lunged out, and the great knees descended slowly as a hydraulic press descends on yellow apples, and soon after that the kites were dropping out of the sky for a feast. His word was law in the herd, and slowly he began to overcome the doubt that the great bulls had of him, doubt of his youth and experience. If he had had three months more of leadership, their trust would have been absolute. But in the meantime, the slow herding toward the Kadah had begun. We will need brave men to stand at the end of the wings of the Kadah, said Ahmed Din. He spoke no less than truth. The man who stands at the end of the wings, or wide-stretching gates of the Kadah, is of course in the greatest danger of being charged and killed. The herd, mad with fright, is only slightly less afraid of the spreading wings of the stockade than of the yelling, whooping beaters behind. Often they will try to break through the circle rather than enter the wings. 
"For two rupees additional I will hold one of the wings," replied old Langur Dass. Ahmad Din glanced at him, at his hard, bright eyes and determined face. Then he peered hard and tried in vain to read the thoughts behind the eyes. "You are a madman, Langur Dass," he said wonderingly. "But thou shalt lie behind the right wing men to pass them torches. I have spoken." "And the two extra rupees?" Langur asked cunningly. Uh, "Maybe. One does not throw away rupees in Upper Burma." Within the hour, the signal of "Mile, mile, go on, go on" was given, and the final lapse of the drive began. The hills grew full of sound. The beaters sprang up with firebrand and rifle and closed swiftly about the herd. The animals moved slowly at first. The time was not quite ripe to throw them into a panic. Many times the herd would leave their trail and start to dip into a valley or a creek bed, but always there was a new crowd of beaters to block their path. But presently the beaters closed in on them. Then the animals began a wild descent squarely toward the mouth of the Kada. Hi! The wild men cried. Oh, you forest pigs! On, on! Block the way through that valley, you brainless sons of jackals! Are you afraid? Ay, stand close, watch, Bjorn, guard your post, Kusru, and now on, on, do not let them halt, are ay. Firebrands waved, rifles cracked, the wild shout of beaters increased in volume. The men closed in, driving the beasts before them. But there was one man that did not raise his voice. Through all the turmoil and pandemonium, he crouched at the end of the stockade wing, tense and silent and alone. To one that could have looked into his eyes, it would have seemed that his thoughts were far and far away. It was just old Langer Doss, named for a monkey and despised of men. He was waiting for the instant that the herd would come thundering down the hill in order to pass lighted firebrands to the bold men who held that corner. He was not certain that he could do the thing he had set out to do. Perhaps the herd would sweep past him through the gates. If he did win, he would have to face alone the screaming, infuriated hillmen, whose knives were always ready to draw. But knives did not matter now. Langer Doss had only his own faith and his own greed, and no fear could make him betray them. Mustag had lost control of his herd. At their head ran the old leader that he had worsted. In their hour of fear they had turned back to him. What did this youngster know of elephant drives? Ever the waving firebrands drew nearer, the beaters lessened their circle, the avenues of escape became more narrow, the yawning arms of the stockade stretched just beyond. Will I win, jungle gods? A little gray man at the Kada wing was whispering to the forest. Will I save you, great one, that I knew in babyhood? Will you go down into chains before the night is done? Ay, I hear the thunder of your feet. The moment is almost here. And now, your last chance, Mustag. Close down, close down, Ahmed Din was shouting to his beaters. The thing is done in another moment. Hasten, pigs of the hills, raise your voice. Now, a hi. The herd was at the very wings of the stockade. They had halted an instant, milling, and the beaters increased their shouts. Only one of all the herd seemed to know the danger. Muztagh himself, and he had dropped from the front rank to the very rear. He stood with uplifted trunk, facing the approaching rows of beaters, and there seemed to be no break in the whole line. The herd started to move on into the wings of captivity, and they did not heed his warning squeals to turn. The circle of fire drew nearer, then his trunk seemed to droop, and he turned too. He could not break the line. He turned, too, towards the mouth of the Kada. But even as he turned, a brown figure darted toward him from the end of the wing. A voice known long ago was calling to him, a voice that penetrated high and clear above the babble of the beaters. Mustag, it was crying, Mustag! But it was not the words that turned Mustag. An elephant cannot understand words, except a few elemental sounds, such as a horse or dog can learn. Rather, it was the smell of the man, remembered from long ago, and the sound of his voice, never quite forgotten. For an elephant never forgets. Mustag, Mustag! 
The elephant knew him now. He remembered his one friend among all the human beings that he knew in his calfhood. The one mortal from whom he had received love and given love in exchange. More firebrands, yelled the men who held the corner of the wing. Firebrands, where is Longer Das? But instead of firebrands that would have frightened beast and aided men, Longer Das stepped out from behind a tree and beat at the heads of the right-wing guards with a bamboo cane that whistled and whacked and scattered them into panic, yelling all the while, Mustag, oh my Mustag, here is an opening, Mustag, come! And Mustag did come, trumpeting, crashing like an avalanche, with Langer Das hard after him, afraid now that he had done the trick, and hot on the trail of Langer Das ran Ahmad Din, with his knife drawn, not meaning to let that prize be lost to him at less than the cost of the trickster's life. But it was not written that the knife should ever enter the flesh of Langer Das. The elephant never forgets, and Mustag was monarch of his breed. He turned back two paces and struck with his trunk. Ahmad Din was knocked aside as the wind whips a straw. For an instant elephant and man stood front to front. To the left of them the gates of the stockade dropped shut behind the herd. The elephant stood with trunk slightly lifted for the moment motionless. The long-haired man who saved him stood lifting outstretched arms. It was such a scene as one might remember in an old legend wherein beasts and men were brothers, or such as sometimes might steal likely something remembered from another age into a man's dreams. Nowhere but in India, where men have a little knowledge of the mystery of the elephant, could it have taken place at all. For Langer Das was speaking to my lord the elephant. Take me with thee, Mustag, monarch of the hills. Thou and I are not of the world of men, but of the jungle and the rain, the silence and the cold touch of rivers. We are brothers, Mustag. O oh, beloved, wilt thou leave me here to die? The elephant slowly turned his head and looked scornfully at the group of beaters bearing down on Langer Das, murder shining no less from their knives than from their eyes. Take me, the old man pleaded, thy herd is gone. The elephant seemed to know what he was asking. He had lifted him to his great shoulders many times in the last days of his captivity, and besides his old love for Langer Das had never been forgotten. It all returned full and strong as ever, for an elephant never can forget. It was not one of the man-herd that stood pleading before him, it was one of his own jungle people, just as deep in his heart he had always known. So with one motion, light as air, he swung him gently to his shoulder. The jungle, vast and mysterious and still, closed its gates behind them. End of Story 5